All right, so looking at spectroscopy, right? Spectroscopy is a type of analytic technique that we use to really try to confirm what is in a specific sample. Now, within module one, we've looked at presumptive techniques. We presume or we, we think that a sub certain substance is present based on a color change, right? If we add a specific, um, if we add ammonia to something, we think that because of this change, right, this specific substance is present, right? Or if we have an aldehyde and we add Tollins reagent, we expect to see a black precipitate or a silver mirror, right? So we think that aldehydes are present. They're, these are presumptive measures, right? Now, spectroscopy is what we use to figure out exactly if these functional groups are present or exactly if these kinds of materials or these kinds of um, molecules are present within a substance. All right. Now, we generally use the electromagnetic spectrum or we generally speak about the electromagnetic spectrum when we get into spectroscopy. Right. So the electromagnetic spectrum, all it is, is relating um, it's a relationship between the different wavelengths and intensities or frequencies of light that are observed, right? And what we're going to generally be looking at is this region of infrared to visible to UV. This region is going to be what we're most concerned about, all right? So some interesting facts about this spectrum. We know that microwaves specifically are called, well, can cause heating in body tissues right microwaves are actually what we use to heat up food right so they heat up on water molecules right? they cause the rapid vibration of water molecules that in turn dissipates heat to the rest of the body so it tends to heat up food we know that infrared radiation right can be felt as heat right and cause its invert so infrared radiation from the sun etc right Infrared radiation actually heats up objects much more faster than regular visible light, right? Ultraviolet radiation can cause normal cells to become cancerous, right? And that's generally the same thing with everything that comes after UV. So for example, X-rays and gamma rays can also cause damaging, right? Um, leading to cancerous um, cells and eventual cell death, right? So there are some aspects of these different types of well, waves at different intensities that can actually be detrimental, right? But we actually use around UV, infrared, and visible light, UV phase really, right? And infrared light to really look at what is present within these samples, okay? So looking here, this is the general spectrum that we'll be looking at, all right? So the wavelength of light is really important as it relates to finding out what, whether a molecule is present somewhere, right? It's these wavelengths that carry specific energies, right, that will determine whether or not we will use different types of spectroscopy, right? And the different wavelengths corresponding to different energies can be used to figure out whether or not specific functional groups are present, right? So we're going to be looking at this and keep in mind, right, the wavelength corresponding to energies and what kind of energies will result in what kind of um, spectroscopic interactions. All right. Now, going back to something in module one of unit one chemistry, right, Max Planck was one of the persons or the person who really came up with this type of um, equation, right, this equation here in which it allows us to really find the amount of energy that is in a specific um, wavelength of light, right? So Planck's constant is here, right, stated here on the screen, and energy itself is equal to h nu, right? h being Planck's constant and nu being generally the frequency, right? So we're looking at the fact that energy can be derived by multiplying Planck's constant by the frequency of light, right? And it's that frequency, right, at these specific wavelengths that we will actually find molecular interactions and based on these interactions we're able to really um, figure out what is present within the sample all right so we know that when the when light itself or these um photons at different frequencies interact uh, with atoms they cause some amount of photo excitation right so atoms exist at different energy levels with, well, electrons rather exist at different energy levels within the atom, 
right? So we have energy level 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? And when the atoms gain energy, they rise to a higher energy level. And when they dissipate the energy, which is emitting the energy, right? They release the same amount of energy that they absorbed. Therefore, energy is said to be quantized, right? So the same amount of energy absorbed, the same amount of energy they emit. So if they rise to, let's say, um, the passion series here, right? Let's say that they rise to the passion series, right? They're going to actually, um, well, not the passion series, rather, the third energy level, right? The amount of energy that it takes an electron to rise to the third energy level is the same amount of energy it would emit for it to go back down to its original energy level, right? And why we're really looking at the Balmer series here is because mostly we tend to look at the visible region, right? Especially with the first type of spectroscopy that we'll be looking at, which is UV spec. All right. So this just drives in the point when any electrons move from energy lower energy level to a higher energy level, they absorb the energy. And when they're dropping back from this high energy level to the low energy level, they emit. All right. So, with no further ado, let's start UV vis spectroscopy. Now, we have to speak about the origin of absorption, right? So, we know that these discrete lines arise from the transition of an electron from the ground state, right, to one of many vibrational or rotational energy levels in an excited electronic um, energy level, right? So, what we're seeing is that when energy absorb is absorbed by these electrons, right, they end up going into a more excited, more unstable orbital, right, that we tend to call the antibonding orbital or the star orbital. So in this case, we're looking at the electrons existing within a double bond within these two carbons here, existing, all right, on a general pi um, molecular orbital, right? But we know that two atomic orbitals combine to give you the molecular orbital. So the double bond is a pi bond, so we're looking at the pi molecular orbital. And when, this, when one of these electrons are really excited, they go to what we call the pi star antibonding orbital. Right? So these orbitals are theoretical orbitals that exist that tend to be empty. Right? Um, and when electrons enter these unstable orbitals, right, it, creates the entire, it makes the entire system high energy and really unstable. And remember, one of the key facts about chemistry is that we want everything to be at the lowest energy possible. We want everything to be as stable as possible. So that's what happens. That's why electrons tend to drop back down to the lower energy levels to really stabilize the system. Right? So we, here we have a pi, the pi star promotion of an electron. All right? By um, some amount of light itself, and we know that light is really denoted by h nu, which is Planck's constant times the frequency. So that photon here, right, will cause a promotion of one electron to the antibonding orbital, and then eventually would actually fall back down in order to stabilize the system. All right, the UV spectrometer is one of the main things that we, um, one of the main machines that we look at in Unit Two chemistry, right? So. The light itself that we're looking at, right, has to be chosen. We have to really do some amount of presumptive tests, right, to figure out, okay, there could be possibly this molecule existing, right, within the sample, right? So what we tend to do now is look for the wavelength, right, that that sample would most likely absorb and then set the machine to that wavelength. So in this case, the machine must have a general light source you must be able to polarize that light into one direction, right? And then use a monochromator, right? To actually split the different wavelengths. And then we focus a slit, right? To really um, allow only one specific wavelength to pass through the sample, right? So what we're saying is that the wavelength of maximum absorbance lambda max for the sample must be selected. Meaning that we, let's say we have an aldehyde, we run a tolerance test and we say that, okay, we, we think that we have an aldehyde on run tolerance test and we see black precipitate. Okay, what this is telling us is that an aldehyde may be present. Now what we're going to do is look for the lambda max of this aldehyde and then that lambda max corresponds to a wavelength. It is the maximum wavelength. So what we're going to do is set the machine to only choose that wavelength of light and then shoot it through the sample to see how much is absorbed and how much is um, not absorbed right and look at that those differences on the detector 
right? So this is a more um, complex look at what a UV spectrometer would really look like. So we tend to have a tungsten lamp or a deuterium lamp. Deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen, right? And they emit light through a filter, right? And that filters out specifically the type of light that we want. And then we send it through a monochromator to really get the specific wavelength that we want as well, right? And we generally shoot this sample, right? This light through a sample, right? And then that absorbance, the amount of light absorbed by that molecule itself will be detected, right? We tend to use a reference as well. So the reference is usually just um, water itself, just distilled water, right? To show that the monochromator is actually working or the UV spectrometer is actually working, right? So using information from the reference to show that it's actually working and the sample, we get a data that actually shoots out a graph that we can look at. And based on our readings of the graph, you can figure out whether or not a specific functional group is present. Right? Now, one of the main persons that we will look at here is Pierre, um, Pierre here, right? So he was one of the persons um, that was integral in creating what we know known as Pierre Lambert's law, right? And what this law space basically speaks about is we can determine the absorbance of a specific um, area within a compound, right? Or the specific absorbance of a molecule by looking at its relationship with the molar absorption coefficient, the molar absorptivity of the compound, as well as the concentration C and the optical path length L. This optical path length usually speaks to the length of the cuvette. So this cuboidal thing that we see here, it's called a cuvette. We look, we're looking at the length, right, of this. So how long, right, well, not really how long, what is the distance that the light travels through the sample, right? That is what L will speak to. So looking at this now, according to Beer Lambert's law, the absorbance of a sample is directly proportional to its concentration and path length. So if we have some incident light, right, passing through a cuvette of a distance L, right, and we have some transmitted light, right, coming out, what we're saying is that at this wavelength here, right, molecules that are present here will absorb the light, right? Let's say that there are aldehydes here. I'm using aldehydes as an example, right? And we set for the wavelength, the lambda max of aldehydes, right? When we shoot that light through, we're supposed, aldehydes are supposed to be absorbing some of that light, and any amount of light that is not absorbed is transmitted here. So what's happening here is that if we have more aldehydes, if we have a higher concentration, then there would be less transmitted light. Because if you understand the concept, if there's all of it is aldehydes, right? Then all of that would be absorbed. That's what's happening here. The percentage transmittance, if all the light is transmitted, if 100% of the light passes through the sample without being absorbed, then we have zero absorbance. Nothing is absorbed. That makes sense. If all light passes through, then nothing was absorbed. But if we have zero transmittance, if no light is transmitted, then our absorbance approaches at infinity. So there's no general 100, right, for absorbance. It's not measured in, per, in um, percentages, but our absorbance will approach infinity, right? As all light continues to be absorbed, right, continuously, right, and none is transmitted, right? So that would be probably in a pure sample, pure sample level, right, of that substance. All of the light will be absorbed and nothing will be transmitted, theoretically, all right? So absorbance and transmittance and molecular orbitals. When, mo when molecules are formed, atomic orbitals actually form the molecular orbitals. We know that, right? So electrons occupy the sigma, pi, and non-bonding orbitals, right? So sigma, pi, and n, right? When sigma or pi bonds are formed, a higher unfavorable energy level, the antibonding orbital is formed associated with a bonding orbital. So I spoke about that briefly before. So bonding orbitals are sigma and pi orbitals. Our antibondings are sigma star and our pi star orbitals. And our non-bonding orbitals are just simply n. Okay? So it comes from the molecular orbital theory. 
So if we have a substance like this that contains two P electrons and two S electrons, right? At this second energy level, right? If we're going to be bonding these electrons, right, will actually form on this lowest energy level here. So if I may use an example, right? If we have something like hydrogen, hydrogen, um, let's look at hydrogen, actually. Just let's let's think of this as a 1s, right? Just using as an example, let's see that this is a 1s, right? What will happen when the orbitals overlap, they will actually form a molecular orbital that shares these two electrons. All right, and that would be fine. When, il when light comes in, it tends to promote these electrons to the unstable orbital, the, the pi star orbital, right? And that creates an unstable species, right? So in order for the electron to actually jump back down, light is gonna be emitted, right? And that is what we're generally talking about. So the pi star orbitals and the sigma star orbitals are unstable orbitals, right? That we can see there, right? And we gener and it's associated with our regular bonding orbitals. You're gonna be looking at molecular orbital theory at a higher level of chemistry, right so we'll just move on from here so uv transitions now there are specific transitions that translate to uv spectroscopy and the only way we'll be able um the, or the only way we'll see that a compound is uv is active is only if it has pi to pi star transitions non-bonding to pi star transitions or non-bonding to sigma star transitions right so these transitions normally produce absorption within the UV vis region, meaning that if your molecule doesn't exhibit any type of these transitions, there is no UV vis interaction and it will just be null and void there, right? So in order for these transitions to occur, right, we can state that these molecules have to possess specific features that are electron rich. Because we know that pi orbitals, that just speaks to um, the fact that the molecule itself has, has overlapping um, double bonds, right? And double bonds are high electron dense areas that uh, we spoke about in module one, right? And if it has non-bonding electrons, that would mean that it's electron rich, meaning that all its electrons participate in bonding, right? But it still has lone pairs, right? Meaning it's electron rich, it has an excess of electrons, right? So these different structural features on these organic molecules that cause these types of UV vis absorptions are called chromophores. So our chromophore would be like a double bond, right? Or lone pairs. So looking at a molecule like this, right? Our chromophores would be our double bonds here, right? And the fact that our double bonds exist, we can have, these are called pi molecular, or, these are in the pi molecular orbitals, right? Our double bonds are really pi molecular orbitals, electrons existing in these pi molecular orbitals, right? And when they get excited, they go to pi star, right? And we can note that because pi to pi star is a UV vis transition, and that means that this molecule here is UV active, right? And one of the major molecules that we can look at is beta carotene. That has a lot of chromophores existing on the molecule. And we know beta carotene because we've seen it in stuff like CSA biology when we look at golden rice, right? Beta carotene is what is present within um, carrots, right? It is present within carrots, right? Getting the name carotene and it gives this an orangish yellow color, all right? And this is because of these chromophores, right? So let's have a look at this. So the absorption is similar to what we spoke about in the crystal field theory, right? With transition metal complexes, right? So it's similar to how colors are emitted from transition metal complexes if you could relate that to unit one chemistry right so it's similar to that in which it will we will absorb the light right um within these electron dense um electron rich ligands because we know that ligands are electron rich molecules and they allow for uv vis transitions right this makes sense because for UV vis transitions to occur, the molecule must have chromophores, and chromophores are areas of electron richness, right? So these ligands will actually have UV vis transitions and give us vis 
visual, visible colors, right? So different, different types of colors depending on the complexes. So it's similar to these, okay? Now what happens if we have some motor transitions in the UV area? Note that we're looking at UV visible. So we have some amount of visible transitions, right? But what happens to the UV transitions that we can't actually see, right? So color intensity is used to determine the concentration of a sample in the UV spectroscopy. For colorless compounds, right, they don't absorb visible light, right? And they cannot be determined directly. So if it doesn't um, absorb visible light, we can't see the compound, right? So the color samples are reacted with coloring agents to form colored complexes which absorb in the visible region. So these are what we call our coloring agents or our colorants, right? So for an example of colorant would be an anhydrin, right? So if we have different types of molecules present within, for example, crime scenes, we could use different types of colorants to see whether or not these mysterious compounds are still present. Right? So ninhydrin is what we tend to use for fingerprints and for blood um, samples. Let's say that we the crime scenes are being scrubbed of blood and different types of bodily fluids. We can use colorants to figure out whether or not these residues are remaining in the area. Right? So we use these right, in forensic chemistry a lot. Right? How do they work? Right? We know that we're we know that we're saying that the molecules are not seen. They're colorless to us, right? So when we add the colorants, what it's doing is adding a chromophore to the molecule. It's attaching an anhydrin, which is really electron rich. We can see all of these double bonds and this ring structure, right? It's attaching itself to the colorless molecule, right? And allowing for light, visible light, to interact with it, right? So it works through what we call a bathochromic shift. So it's a change in spectral band position in the absorption, reflectance, transmittance, or the emission spectrum of a molecule with a longer wavelength, right? So what we're saying is that if we have a lambda max right here and we add a colorant, we can either have a bathochromic shift, right? Which shifts it in a red, in it's what we just call a red shift, right? It shifts to the left, right? If we know how UV and visible light works, right? visible light is here then there's uv so therefore we're gonna need to shift into the visible region which is our bathochromic shift or our red shift right and if we want to shift something out of visibility we will add a colorant or we'll we'll remove the colorants or the chromophores and it will actually result in a hypsochromic shift into the blue uv region Right? So if we have something that um, cannot be seen really through visible light, we add a chromoph we add a colorant, right? That would actually result in a bathochromic shift and shift it into the visible region so we can see it. Right? If something exists within the UV region, if we shine UV light on it, we are able to see it, right? But if we want to see it without UV light, we add the colorant, right, for it to be seen within the UV spectrum. All right. Now, going back to absorbance and concentration, this is a graphical representation of Bear Lambert's law, saying that the absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration. Right. So we're going and we're gonna have the cell, cell length as well. Right. So we're gonna have this um, line of best fit being drawn. Right. So as absorbance increase, well, as the concentration of the substance increase, the absorbance of light would increase. All right. So here's a question, you guys can pause, you guys can have a look at the question and see if you guys can answer the question. I want you guys to try it and let me know what you get for the answer here. So the applications of UV vis spectroscopy, all right? So an example of it, right? This is one of the things that we have in our syllabus to look at. So UV vis spectroscopy is widely used in an ad used as an analytical technique for quantifying the concentration of various substances in a solution, right? So using the different wavelengths, right? Um, well, we know that molecules absorb light at different wavelengths, specific wavelengths, right? And the amount of light is absor absorbed, right, is proportional to the concentration of the absorbing substance. So we can use UV spectroscopy to find um, different types of, um, well, the concentration, 
the levels of the presence of a compound within different settings, right? So we can use it for the quantitation of different substances, including um, in iron tablets, glucose, urea in blood, and cyanide in water, right? So we're able to quantify the amount of ferrous sulfate within these substances if we dissolve it and then shine light that is specific to um, the substance, right? We can be we can actually use it, right, to actually find the amount of iron present, right? So the iron tablets is extracted and reacted with a reagent like 110 phenatherine, right? And it forms this colored complex with the iron ion, right? And then we actually look for the phenatherine complex, right? And then relate it to how much iron it's combined to, and we're able to find the amount of concentration of iron, right? Glucose quantitation as well, right? We can use um, UV vis spectroscopy to figure out how much glucose is present within a specific area, right? And we tend to react to the glucose, right? Um, with different types of dyes, for example, O, um, diancidine, right, resulting in this color change that we can use for absorbance, right. So you, urea in blood as well, we can figure out how much urea is present when we react it with the reagent such as diacetyl monoxamine, right, which forms this colored complex. So all we're doing is adding colorants and then looking for the concentration of these colorant complexes and we'll be able to find the amount of something within a sample, right? Also with cyanide and water, right, we can use this to find the cyanide present, right, because it is UV vis active. So we tend to really um, use reagents like pyridine, um, bartiburic acid, um, bar barbituric acid rather, Right, Con that would actually chelate our um, form complexes with cyanide, and we're able to figure out um, through the absorbance the concentration of cyanide in water. Right, so those are general applications that we're said to look at within um, the syllabus. Right, so generally we detect chromophore groups. Right, the spectrum compared with molecules containing various chromophore groups and supplemented with IR and mass spec. So even though we use UV spec to figure out whether or not these groups are present, we can use IR spec and mass spec to figure out what the rest of the compound is so we can pinpoint exactly what compound it is. Because with UV, we can figure out, okay, there's a hydroxyl group present, there's an aldehyde, um, well, there's an aldehyde group present, right? Carbonyl groups present, right? But how do we know specifically what aldehyde it is, what alcohol it is, what type? Of molecule it is what specific molecule it is we would have to treat it with IR spec and mass spec right and that's what we're gonna get into on the next